Hola, bienvenidos a todos. We're excited to be here today to talk about uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Christian Buchel. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a manager in the MC practice based out of Dallas, Texas, and a proud third generation Mexican American. Um, I'm honored today to be the moderator of the panel. Uh, it's the first time that we've celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month at Cordero, so it's a real special occasion. And it's the seventh installation of our Cordero Listens. So today we're going to spend time with all of our coworkers that you've seen in the initial invite that came out of Hispanic and Latino descent to share their backgrounds, their stories, culture with the rest of the company. Um, we have a really great group here, a diverse set of experiences that we want to dig into, both kind of lighthearted ones that we get to hear about people's backgrounds, as well as potentially some tougher, deeper personal notes to, to discuss. So without further ado, um, I'd love to get started now. So I'll, first off, I'm gonna call on some of my panelists here. I'd love for you to give me a, some information on your background. I wanna hear about your personal story, your journey, your family history, um, if you're first generation, you immigrated, you're third generation, wherever. Um, I'd love to just learn a little bit more about you and let uh, others that have joined to learn about you as well. So I'm gonna start off, Oline Moran, would you mind going first? Yeah, uh, thank you, Christian. Um, so, Oli Moran, um, I am a uh, immigrant from Mexico. So, I was born in Mexico City, uh, grew up there um, until I was 16 years old before I moved to um, to, to the U.S. to New York. I am a, the son of a Mexican father and uh, American. Uh, mom um, growing up has always been, you know, so I was a proud Mexican, uh, you know, remember getting in fights with uh, my parents about, you know, forcing them to, forcing me to learn English and, and whatnot. So um, definitely grew up as a, as a very proud Mexican and, and continue to to do so. Um, like I mentioned, I grew up in, in Mexico, but moved to New York. Um, and then after college, uh, a little kind of anecdote, um, I started my own Mexican restaurant um, and did that for, for a couple of years. So cooking has always been a passion of mine um, and uh, always, you know, I tend to incorporate my Mexican heritage in it, even if I'm cooking pasta. My, my wife always makes fun of me for putting chipotle in anything and everything. So um, if you taste any of my dishes, they'll probably have some, some Latin uh, flair. Uh, so... Yeah, excited to, to tell you all a little bit more about myself and I'm um, excited to learn about some of the other panelists as well. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Aline. Uh, so next I'm going to go to, we have a guest from our Cordero UK office, uh, Callum Conejo Watt. Would you mind giving us an intro next? Hi there. Um, yep, so I'm Callum. Um, I'm probably fairly unique on this call. Um, my dad emigrated from Costa Rica to Scotland um, back in the, the 60s. Um, and at one point in time, my family were the only Costa Ricans within Scotland. Um, so that kind of made us a very small and close knit uh, community. We were very much very family orientated. It also made growing up um, as a half Costa Rican, half Scot, um, interesting um, from the point of view that uh, some people saw me as, or some people saw it as kind of a novelty and some people didn't know what to expect because at early in the 90s, Scotland wasn't really the most diverse place. It still isn't. Um, so I, it'll be interesting to talk about some of my experiences there, um, but very much excited to be on this call and uh, learn about the other panelists. Thank you so much, Callum. So next, I'm going to call on Carolina Herrera, please. Hello, I am so excited to be here today. Um, my name is Carolina Herrera. I am from da I'm from San Antonio, Texas, but I work at Career in Dallas in the Dallas office in the user experience practice. My I am a first generation American, Venezuelan American. Uh, my parents are both from Venezuela, Caracas, Venezuela. So that is where they grew up. They are the first in our family to immigrate over to the States. And so um, I spent all of my summers growing up, going back to Venezuela to see all of the family and um, learn more about our culture. And just excited to be here to share more about those stories and, and to hear more from my fellow panelists. So thank you, Christian. Thank you, Carolina. All right, so I'm gonna move on next to Jose Briones. 
Not when I ended there. I apologize for that, guys. All right, <laughs> I was on mute. Uh, hola a todos, or hello to all. Uh, my name is Jose Briones. I am with the uh, uh, Cloud and Infrastructure Group here at Prodera. Uh, I'm a technology uh, technical architect here. Been here with the organization a little uh, going on almost two years. Uh, I am a first generation Mexican American. Uh, I was born in Houston, so I'm a long time Houston native. Uh, you know, of course, uh, Spanish was my first language. So I'm very fluent in that. Um, both of my parents migrated from Mexico. Uh, my father, may he rest in peace, uh, uh, moved, migrated from Oklahoma, which is approximately two hours south of Eagle Pass, Texas. Uh, he came here on a workman's visa, visa and he later uh, you know, gained his residency and then became a uh, American citizen. Uh, my mother migrated to the States here uh, through her first marriage. Uh, fortunately, that didn't work out. Um, she is from Linares, Nuevo León. It's a small town right outside of uh, Monterrey. Linares is about two hours south of the Texas border as well. Uh, my parents uh, both met here in Houston. Uh, they were blessed to have me. Just a little humor there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, after their unity, of course, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, just kidding. I'm just blessed to have my parents and, you know, blessed to be a part of the Hispanic culture and just happy to be here. So. Thanks so much, Jose. Uh, next, I'll call on uh, our Cordero's very own Christina Niver. Thanks, Christian. Hi, everybody. Christina Niver. Um, I'm also out of the Dallas office and I'm in management consulting. Um, so I was born in Dallas, but my entire family is from Puerto Rico. So my parents um, and the rest of the family were born and raised there. My parents moved to the United States just before I was born. And Spanish was the first and only language that we spoke at home. So similar to Aline, learned, um, learned English at daycare and at school, um, and then would flip to Spanish when I came home. Always caught people off guard that my mom would speak to me in Spanish and I could hold a conversation in English and really couldn't even tell the difference, honestly. Um, just kind of went with the flow. But similar to Callum, um, you know, I don't necessarily look Puerto Rican or what you would expect a Puerto Rican to look like. And so really lived in this kind of in-between space of, um, you know, my Caucasian friends and having very different traditions and home life. Um, but then also from a Puerto Rico perspective, I don't necessarily have that strong accent that most of my family does and obviously was not born there. So living in this middle space most of my life, but so proud uh, to be from the island and we're a very loud, proud, and big family. So thanks, Christian. Thanks so much, Christina. And last but not least, I have Jim Jimenez. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Yeah, hello, everyone. So yeah, I'm, a, uh, my, I'm Jim Jimenez. My given name is actually Anselmo. So Jim is actually a nickname derived from my last name that goes back to middle school. Uh, over a beer sometime, I, I'll, I'll tell you the story. But uh, in a nutshell, yeah, I'm a fourth generation uh, Mexican-American. Uh, both of my, uh, my parents, grandparents and my great grandparents migrated to Texas uh, in the early 1800s. Um, been here ever since. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time together. I have a huge family. My uh, On my father's side, he had 13 brothers and sisters and my mom had five brothers. Of course, uh, they've all had kids, so we're, you know, big extended family. We tend to spend a lot of time uh, on the weekends cooking out, enjoying, uh, you know, each other's company. And then over the holidays, um, we definitely focus some energy on tamales, which is you know, something that uh, I've been accustomed to, to doing, you know, from the time I was I was a kid. So, uh, yeah, I've been at Cradera a little over two and a half years. Um, I guess I primarily focus in uh, information security and cloud infrastructure. So that's just a little bit about me. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, yeah, that the tamale making every uh, every Christmas is quite the uh, event. If you've ever, if anyone here has ever been to a, able to attend a friend's family event making tamales, it's like a it's like a factory at least in my household. Uh, and we have a foreman and my my abuela who's very strict on how you make them. Too much masa and you get in trouble. Um, all right, so now what I'm going to do is I'll move on for the or to our first question. I'm going to direct this first question to Olene. Um, so Olene, um, when is the first time that you felt different from those around you or you were made aware of the, your race and culture? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting um, situation for me since you know I grew up in Mexico um, and you know not looking uh, Mexican. Uh, you know, my my mom being American, um, I'm you know white and look American. Um, so I think from the from the get go, you know, growing up, um, it was it was always a, a challenge to you know think through you know and having to explain you know my background. Um, the, the 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 nice thing about uh, the culture, however, is that uh, they're very uh, welcoming and receptive, right? So, um, you know, I, I certainly grew up in um, in a poor town in the outskirts of, of Mexico City, and my dad was a farmer uh, that also, you know, had family, um, you know, that were you know farmers. Uh, so uh, it was always, you know, I could always feel and sense the the eyes looking at me and, and kind of, you know, walking into a, a room. Um, I knew that I kind of stood out, um, but it was, it was very nice to still feel walk, welcome and, and part of the family and, you know, kind of just reinforce that pride that I had in, in my background. And then what was interesting too, is that, that it was a different angle when I moved to, to, to New York, um, where now I was in a place where I, looked more you know i looked american and um you know everybody assumed that i was but when i started talking more about my background and people there were always you know kind of questions and um things that at point times just were um it, at the very least you know just misplaced um and at times just felt offensive right where you know they would make jokes and at some point it'd be oh but not you know not your type or not your kind um so that was difficult for me to to balance right where they're they're trying to you know be be funny and um you know making kind of jokes um but at the same time kind of hitting hard and hitting home and making it difficult to to really uh explain it to them that it's not okay and that it you know that when you're saying it's not about them it it, it is kind of it is about me and, and it is hard for me not to take it personal so a um, little bit of angles you know I, I feel like throughout my life I'm, I'm always been somewhat of an outsider uh, no matter where I go because of that kind of balance right and that duality that I have to, to live it with um, but yeah thanks so much for that answer uh, I know I can I can uh, sympathize with uh, the same feelings at times. Um, Yo, know, you're you're Mexican. Well, you're you're not really Mexican, are right, you? Right, exactly. Like the kind of the emphasis they put on some of the way uh, that can be said. So it's not easy to, to work through that. But uh, I'm nonetheless, being proud of your heritage. But for sure. I can't, I, before I move on to the next question, I have to ask the same question to you, Callum. Uh, being Costa Rican and living in Scotland, I imagine you had many instances where this question was applicable. So I'll repeat, when was the first time you felt different or from those around you or made aware of your race or culture? Yeah, that's um, very true. For me, it's um, from when I was at uh, high school. Um, the moment people know know my name, Callum Kneel, what I'm very proud of who I am, where I come from. Um, and I've always had the opportunity to change my name. Some of my uncles actually did because of how difficult that's been for them within the UK. I, I'm I'm keeping it. It's who I am. But at school, I always noticed that people would make fun of my name, make jokes. I would sometimes be the only um, uh, different person in the class, even though I don't ne necessarily look different from anybody else. It's just they have that association. So it's Sometimes it's hard not to take personally, but overall, um, it's kind of showing them who I am and um, that I'm not really that different as well. Do you ever have any good instances of kind of showcasing your culture to some of your friends or they were like, oh, wow, that's awesome. Love to hear any stories you have on, from there. Yeah, I mean, th there's tons of instances. Um, uh, at university, we used to do potluck um, and having a, a grown up with um, lots of uh, Latin American foods um, and obviously the dancing as well. Um, I, I like to um, uh, make uh, calvo, uh, uh, calda, calvo, um, apologies for the, the word, but basically black beans, rice, um, lots of good veg and 
um, show, show my friends uh, that. And I'm also very much a big proponent of um, salsa, um, Latin dance, and bring my friends along to um, to that as well. That's great. I, I hope you're able to find all the ingredients you need because I know that that can. I have friends that live abroad and they have trouble sometimes finding what they need. So I'll move to the next question here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna send this one over to Christina first. So what I'd like to ask is, can you speak to cultural differences within the Hispanic or Latino community as it relates to your own identity with your culture of being a Puerto Rican uh, woman? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Christian. Um, like you said, I, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm a woman, but I live in Texas where the primary kind of Hispanic population is Mexican. And so growing up when people discovered that I was indeed Hispanic, the immediate question was, oh, so you're Mexican? Do you need a passport? Like asking lots of lots of questions around that and making a lot of assumptions um, about my background. So always trying to teach those, just teach and help um, educate a little bit about the diversity that's within the Hispanic culture, um, the diversity of countries, uh, traditions, language, appearance, <laughs> background, um, especially even just looking at my family. I've got a cousin that's red haired, green eyed, blonde, I'm usually blonde, <laughs> wide. Um, and just even, you know, looking at my own family and the diversity that we have. And so just trying to use those moments to help bring people along the journey of um, just how diverse the Hispanic uh, world can be. Um, but I think being in Texas, it was always just assumed I was Mexican. And so just being able to teach folks about Puerto Rico and the foods and the music and even just like how different we can be in the words that we use, right? We all speak Spanish, but it's very colloquial. Um, you know, the way that I say banana is how the Mexic, you know, how you say it in Mexico is different as well. So um, it was always used as a learning opportunity, but I think growing up, it was just kind of process for me of, hey, I don't want to get offended when people say that, but how can I use it as a teaching moment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, food's a bit different. Uh, we don't have mofongo in Mexico, that's for sure. Um, it's a very, very Puerto Rican <laughs> thing. Um, and Carolina, I'd also love your your input on this, being coming having family from Venezuela and um, the, the current state of Venezuela and how that's impacted your uh, culture and identity. Yeah, thanks, Christian. It is the the hispanic culture is so vast so diverse so similar just picking back off what christina was saying there's just so much uh beautiful different traditions languages cultures dancing all the things just echoing christina um and so for me personally growing up i had i ran into a lot of the same assumptions christina did a lot of people would find out that um I'm a Latina and they'd be like, oh, you are Mexican, so you know all about these foods, all these things. And I'd be like, actually, our culture is like very different. Our Spanish is a lot closer to Spain Spanish. It's the food's very different. Um, and a lot of people just didn't really understand that. And, and that was really tough growing up when I'm also trying to continue and learn more about my own family's history and culture in the mix of a very predominant Mexican, beautiful culture um, as well. And so uh, just a lot of intricacies and just like learning and developing about the different ways that like the Latina, there's so many like that's so big. It's so broad. The umbrella is so huge, like you barely scratch the surface. And um, I think even Texas barely scratches the surface when it comes to the different food options and the dancing. And so um, there's just so much out there, so much beautiful history, beautiful culture, beautiful language. And um, I definitely struggled with that growing up with figuring out I would go to Venezuela and it would be so different than my Latina amigas here in San Antonio, like just the, the, the dynamics and the different households. And so um, it definitely was tricky and just trying to share that those differences with my friends and um, just growing up and trying to better understand my family and, and also all in the midst of just trying to also blend in with my American friends and try to um, and so there's just a lot of just differences that are really beautiful and um, it definitely impacted my personal journey trying to still discover who I am as a Venezuelan American Latina woman so thanks so much for that 
Yeah, you, uh, you find those differences pretty quickly. If you get a group of Latinos in a room, they'll, you get the Argentinian arguing with the Uruguayan or who likes mate more, or you have, uh, it's like barbecue in the South. Like someone's gonna have, like, that's, we don't make beans that way. We do it this other way. So it's always fun to find those nuances and it's part of what makes it really beautiful. So next question I got is gonna go to you, Jim, um, is how has your cultural identity impacted your professional identity? Yeah, uh, so there was a point in time where I actually ran my own business. So I did that for about 10 years. And <clears throat> there was a point where uh, some of the businesses that were, uh, or that we were picking up were, were Spanish speaking you know, ownership. So there was a, a family of, uh, of one of the companies that came from Mexico City, another from Spain. Uh, there was even another family that was from Cuba. And one of the things I figured out in talking to them uh, you know, the, the Spanish that I spoke growing up in Texas was <laughs> definitely not proper Spanish. So, I mean, the, the thing I noticed is just, you know, growing up as a kid, I, I don't know that I gave it much thought. I, I like you and Olin, you know, like complected for the most part, I, I probably got assumed that I, I was uh, not a Mexican-American. But then in interacting with the, those other cultures, I just picked up on the, you know, the, the different the, the things that, you know, made us the same, but at the same time, there are a lot of differences in those cultures. So uh, there was a point in time where, uh, you know, I, I was I kind of was self-aware or even conscientious of the fact that, you know, going into these meetings, talking to, to especially the, the folks from Spain that only spoke Spanish, uh, I felt ill-equipped to, to have, you know, these complex or, or conversations about some of the things that we were talking about. So that, that was really the first time uh, I noticed it and I and you know for a while I, I you know definitely tried to improve my Spanish and try to do other things to just you know familiarize myself with those other cultures just to to be better, be able to help better serve them uh, uh, in the work that I was doing with them so I think that's that, that's one impact that, that I recall uh, you know before yeah definitely yeah, the language you speak in a professional setting is going to change a little bit. Uh, I remember when when I studied abroad and I, I, when I went to Spain, I the first someone said it like, hola tío. I was like, what the heck? Why is he calling me uncle? Like, that's just like, dude. So it, you find the nuances real quick, even when you're in a professional setting. Um, Christina, I'd like to ask you the same question as um, being one of uh, who's been at Cordero a long time. And how has your cultural identity uh, impacted your professional identity? That's a that's a really good question. Um, you know, honestly, when you pinged me that question earlier this morning, it really uh, forced me to reflect um, on that because I think just given my name, especially my married name, doesn't it come across as uh, of Latin descent? You know, I don't necessarily look like your stereo, you know, like Hispanic necessarily. Um, and so I would say at work, it's I almost feel like it didn't come up very often. There was always just that assumption that. I was Caucasian, I was white, like, that's it, you know? Um, and so I would surprise a lot of people <laughs> whenever it did come up. But honestly, Christian, it came up in more of the one-on-one -on -one conversations of, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Well, me and my 15 closest family members are getting together to <laughs> make pasteles or morcilla, you know? Like, that's what we're doing this weekend. And they're like, what are you talking about? And just bringing them up to speed about where I'm from, where my family's from. Um, so it was always coming up in those one-on-one -on -one kind of personal conversations. Um, you know, I don't know that it ever was necessarily something I, I led with or or that naturally came up in any sort of business setting. Um, but it's been fun to just, especially this past year, to just kind of reckon with that a little bit, um, especially now that I have two daughters. So I want to pass down that pride and that culture and that heritage. And like, how do I how do I do that? And so I know that's not necessarily the professional side of things, but it all blends together if we're being honest. So um, it's just been an interesting journey and an evolution in myself and how that comes up at work and in conversations. That's great. I know I remember uh, us early on in my first couple of years, I remember we were you were, we were talking, you had to take a phone call and you immediately answered it and go full blown Spanish. I was like, wait, <laughs> what's going on? Like. Wait, I want to talk to you in Spanish too. Um, but I know that your husband also speaks Spanish. So is that something that you both you speak it in the house, trying to teach your teach your girls how to how to speak Spanish? 
We definitely try. So Nick is half Chilean. Um, his mom was actually born and raised there um, and fled because of political persecution when she was 15. Um, but uh, Nick does try to speak it. He understands it really well. And now being part of the family for almost you know, 10 plus years, he definitely understands it, especially as quickly as Puerto Ricans speak. Um, so he's catching on. Um, it's something that's definitely a priority for us. So for instance, my mom is not allowed to speak English in my house, <laughs> like only Spanish. I want the girls to hear that all the time. She's over here all the time. When we go to family functions, like I, I really push for us to make um, Puerto Rican food and be in the kitchen and teach the girls like this is what it is. This is a platano. This is a morcilla. This, these are the habichuelas. Like this is how we're doing it, you know. Um, so we really push that and try as best we can and, and, and just really, again, just teaching them how beautiful it is and how amazing it is and how cool it is to be a little bit different um, and just to have that pride. So we're trying. We're not perfect, but we're trying. <laughs> That's great. And right there, habichuelas, not... That's something I would typically would say. Um, well, next question, want to, to go to Jose to answer this one. This one's a little bit more of a, uh, typically a deeper topic, something that we want to touch on because in these career listen panels, we want to be open, is how has the continual debate on immigration impacted you? I imagine many people here, um, when they, they hear Latino, they probably think immigration, big issue. So I know that it's impacted probably everyone here in some way or another. So I'd love to hear your background and uh, how that's impacted you. Yeah, thanks, Virginia. Uh, yeah, so I'll be honest with you. Um, immigration to me is a very sensitive topic. Um, when it comes to this topic, I think of my parents, you know. My parents came here to chase the American dream, right? The American dream, which which uh, consists of, and, and I, it's it's the ideals of freedom, equality, and opportunity. You know, uh, I think, um, <clears throat> and just thinking about it, just, you know, it does make me a little upset, right? Because Sure, there are individuals that come here and make mistakes, right? And they're immediately called out based on, you know, their residential status or them being illegal or them being Latino. And, you know, what I'm trying to say is not everybody makes mistakes. And just because, you know, he's Latino or his resident, uh, residential status doesn't mean it. we need to be, you know, categorized on, under a certain category. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken with many immigrants, uh, you know, a lot of them who have been both legal and here legally. Most of them come here to provide for their families. Uh, and, and you know, people need to understand, and just, just to add some color here, is the Metsco wage uh, can range anywhere from $50 a week to $100 a week. Imagine, you know, doing that and trying to provide for a very large family. So many of them come here for the opportunity to follow the American dream, right, and, and provide for their families. Uh, and they leave their families behind, but you, what you don't understand is that they're not doing it just just to do it. They're, they're doing it to sacrifice. I've worked with many individuals because um, I worked in the construction industry for a lot, very long time, and um, I actually witnessed you know an individual you know get picked up. Of course, he, you know he was here illegally, but when I saw the sadness in his eyes, he was like, "What am I going to tell my family? I can't provide for them anymore." So yeah, I mean, I think um, we can't. Not everybody should be judged um, based on the residential status. You don't know why they come here or what they're trying to achieve or what they're trying to provide. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it it's one of those topics that, you know, it, 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 it's close to home. Uh, I've had many cousins who, who actually came here and they say, hey, you know what? I came here legally with with a, with a residential pass or and they stay here because they love it so much and they start working and they provided for families they get accustomed and they see everything that the uh, that you know here in America that we have and they're like we don't have this you know we, we don't have these uh, these uh, you know accommodations or th there's there's just so much more uh, and so much more opportunity in the states so you know I mean I think um, you know I think it's imperative to for us as as Latinos to to understand and for others to understand why, you know, why they're coming out here and what, what they're after. So, yeah, I mean, I hope that answers that question. Uh, Christian, but sorry. I mean, yeah, it's one of those topics that it, it does hit home. It hit, hits home very, very closely. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's a very, it's a difficult topic and it's something that hasn't, there's no solution to it. There's no easy thing. They've been, or there's been arguments over it for the last 30 years and it doesn't seem to be getting much better at times. Um, but at the end, you, no matter what you feel on the immigration topic, they're humans and they're trying to, the 99.9% .9 of them are coming to make a better life for their family. And uh, it's not an easy decision to pack up your stuff, hop on potentially a train and make that journey. So 
um, some empathy uh, goes a long way and some compassion for those um, without getting into the political side of it. But uh, Carolina, I'd also like to ask you the same question, um, knowing that your, your, you, your family immigrated from Venezuela and uh, you still have lots of family there. It's probably a topic and I know not even just uh, immigration between the US and Venezuela, but also the immigration between Venezuela and Colombia is another thing that's um, a sensitive topic even in South America. We, we like to think of immigration consistently between US and other countries, but it's also a topic within the Latino community as well, the different countries. Right, yeah, thank you, Christian. Um, this, similar to Jose, this, this is a topic that is really uh, close to my heart. It's very, um, it's really tough there to give some context. My family was the first to come to the States when I was a child. And we had a ton of family in Venezuela. In the last five to 10 years, Venezuela has, the society has basically collapsed. Uh, the, there's a huge humanitarian crisis. Um, for, for some content text, families who are trying to, the best example I have is you take your family to McDonald's and you try to buy a meal for four people. That meal is going to cost someone in Venezuela an entire month's worth of salary to buy that. So people in Venezuela are, are, are desperate. There's no medicine. There's no food. There's nothing on the shelves. And, and so people are fleeing the country. They're fleeing into neighboring countries. They're trying to come to America. And it's really difficult uh, because I think here we have this misconception that people that are coming to America, the pillar of American freedom and hope, um, there's a sterile approach to it, I would say, uh, that people think that the people that are coming are common misconceptions are they're criminals. They are here to take over all of our jobs. They're here to, you know, be potentially terrorists. They're here to, there's just all these, these really difficult ideas that are that are missing false information that are being kind of thrown around that in reality a lot of the people that are coming to the border are desperate families they're people that are trying to find a better life for their families and and what kind of person wants to up and root everything that they know to come to a completely different country for no reason you know that's just it's difficult uh, and really sad because i feel like i just wish mo more of us approach this topic um, with empathy, with compassion, with the realization that these are humans and these are human stories that are desperate, um, that deserve more of our empathy, that deserve more from us than I think what we are um, giving them. And so it's just a really tough topic. I, if people have more questions, please reach out to me. I would love to share more stories and, and dive deeper in this. If you have questions, I, I would really like to open that up to hit me up offline. We can go to coffee and I'll share more about those stories. So thank you so much, Carolina. I bet the majority of people on the call today know someone, whether you know or not, that came here um, without papers and the word there, I don't want to say legal, I don't want to say alien, it's dehumanizing, um, they're undocumented. And odds are some of them are your your friends, your family, your family, uh, your friends, parents, and some of them are here on DACA, they're here in the dreamer status. And um, I know uh, quite a few friends that were in college with me that were dreamers and um, they, I mean, they've, they've grown to, they love America, they loved working here and they've, they're contributing. and. It's a real tough, it's a real thorny topic, no doubt. Um, Aline uh, or Colum, do you either of you have anything to touch on there? I know Colum come being with family, immigrating all across the sea. I imagine that's not an easy move. And, and I love to hear your family's experience from doing that and how they and how they uh, kind of assimilated and became a part of Scotland as well. Sure, yeah, um, like immigrations, it, it's an interesting topic actually here as well because we we're going through Brexit right now, and a lot of one of the the issues around that was immigration. For for my family and my, on my dad, really, it was I think probably smoother than most because there was some connection to to the country, which made them the immigration for them easier. I I think not getting to politics and everything, but the whole topic of immigration here is interesting because. People see me as, I guess, they see me Scottish, born in the UK, 
very typical uh, a Brit. And therefore, when they talk about uh, immigration and what should be done around that, they don't necessarily see that side of it, of, of me and my my family. Um, so I, I kind of do get into some interesting conversations and it's um, always a bit painful to have some awkward and difficult conversations where people may have different different opinions. Um, and just because they see me as uh, British, even though um, uh, my dad obviously um, uh, is from Costa Rica. But in, in terms of the positive side of things, it's it was e really easy for uh, them and my family to integrate and move over. And there, there wasn't any major hurdles they had to go through. I, I think it's probably more humorous than anything in terms of their initial um, w when they came over. They, my, my dad and my uncles came over when they were what, teenagers and a lot of schools in Scotland at that time were wearing kilts um, and not that not being part of the Hispanic culture, they were actually um, um, hesitant to to engage um, in wearing some kilts themselves. So so there was a bit of uh, learning and cross cultural exchange there when when they did go to school. <laughs> that's that's an amazing story. I can only imagine the uh, the difference, the culture shock there. Uh, put on a kill, you you come over to Scotland. Here's your kill. <laughs> Uh, Oline, any anyone else have anything they want to touch on from the immigration question? Yeah. I know this is a, an important topic for for many in the Hispanic Latino community. Yeah, I mean, I think for me it was you know I, I see it, I saw it with my my family. I had a lot of cousins that uh, came to the U.S. Um, a lot of them, you know, uh, without documents. Um, and I think what people don't understand, um, and Carolina mentioned it a little bit or a lot bit, um, the, the amount of sacrifice that, that kind of goes into it, right, where um, they leave their families behind um, and, you know, risk their lives and, you know, they, they spend their time, you know, working and trying to figure out uh, ways to support and provide for their families, but uh, really having some some really difficult um decisions to make as they continue to you know to live here right i mean i've had cousins that whose mother passed away back in mexico and them having to make that decision that you know they they can't go back to visit right or to you know be part of the funeral um it's just you know it's crushing to in, in some cases um and that's just you know one of, of many um stories right and you just kind of hear it again and again and, and people don't really understand it uh, without, you know, living those 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 experiences. So I think it comes down to uh, understanding and, and listening and, and really being able to hear uh, people out and hear people's stories. Um, there, there's usually being driven out of uh, necessity, you know, fighting for their lives, uh, fighting to support others. It isn't a drive to, you know, greed or just make more money or, you know, exploitation um and most of the times it's it's coming out of um you know survival um so uh, that that's kind of the the big message that i communicate to, to everybody awesome thanks for that so i have a couple other questions we're going to get to but if anyone in the chat or anyone who's joined has any questions feel free to submit those in the q a um, and then we, we can get to those so while you're thinking of those questions, uh, my, my next one here is, is where do you see the level of acceptance in the Hispanic Latino community in the US? And what are your thoughts on how to increase efforts towards inclusion here in the US? So I'll open this up for anyone um, who wants to answer this, because I, I think we've, we've hit most of the ones I wanted to talk to, but um, I'll, I'll go first and I'll, I'll give some input from my point of view on this one is, um, I, I've seen it change a lot recently. I think there's becoming a more nuanced conversation about the differences and the, the Latinos that are in the U.S. You're seeing um, the calling the difference of there's the Me Mexicans who live in Texas are going to have a different perspective and experience than those who are Chicanos in L.A. or versus Cubans and Puerto Ricans living in Miami. And I think the national conversation in the past has kind of lumped all of those as Latino or Hispanic together. And I'm, I've 
personally been encouraged with being able to see the richness of the different cultures being discussed in the national media and stories um, and publications. So I mean, I'm encouraged to see some of that change and being able to really understand uh, the difference in each of those cultures. But I'll open the floor to anyone else who wants to jump in here. Raise your hand in the chat. Or we can go to a, a question that we have here in the Q&A. I see that um, Mariola Sebastian's asked, I would like to hear from more speakers about the challenge of bringing up your children in a different culture, but still wanting to pass on your heritage. That's an excellent question. Um, I know, Christina, you touched on that, but does it, anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a for me, it's a it's a challenge. Um, you know, my my girls, I mean, it's five, they're five and, and two. Um, so it, it, it's something that I want to, um, you know, share and, you know, I want them to learn Spanish, uh, but it, it's hard. Um, it's hard because they don't hear Spanish and um, you know, my wife doesn't speak a, a ton of a Spanish either, so it's it, it's hard to find those moments for me to um, kind of talk about it. Um, and when I do, there's you know resistance. Uh, so it's a lot of times uh, easier for me to you know uh, defer back to English or something like that. Um, I think my team's died. You're still there. We can see you. Okay. All right, good. Um, so um, it, 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 it's, it's a struggle. Uh, and same thing for culture. From a cultural standpoint, um, I try to, um, you know, cook for them, you know, Mexican food. And I mean, it's just a typical, you know, five and three year old. There's there's pickiness around what they want to eat in general, uh, but trying to, you know, provide additional and, and kind of, you know, it's like, you know, making them something that's a little bit more sophisticated becomes difficult but to me it just comes back to, to trying right uh, and taking those those wins taking those victories and just kind of building upon it uh finding those opportunities to talk to them about a particular tradition or or culture and uh hopefully some of those things kind of stick and then they continue to ask questions and you know when my oldest daughter comes home and you know tells me about spanish and she gets excited uh, it's just kind of continuing to to leverage those those moments to to build on top of that, um, because those are probably the ones that are going to that they're going to remember, um, and um, it's it's important uh, for me. Um, That's great. Thanks for sharing, Jose. Do you have something to add there? So you go off mute. No, no, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to add. I mean, uh, you know, he nailed it. I don't think that uh, it's necessarily a challenge to me. Uh, I, I want my kids to know about my Hispanic culture, right? I, I want them to know about the American culture. So to me, it's just, I, and, I, and we live in a very diverse community, right? So we have uh, individuals and kids of all different uh, cultures and backgrounds, and, you know, and especially in my neighborhood, right? So we normally sit together and, and we'll sit down and we'll talk about each other's cultures. And I think it's, you know, fun uh, to learn about other cultures. I actually welcome it. I invite it. I love to taste different foods. Uh, you know, it, it's just, to me, it's, I think it puts us in a way better place, you know. Uh, so I, as far as the challenge is, sure, of course, I think everything's going to be a challenge. But I think I found it actually fascinating. And, and so a way to learn about everybody's different cultures. So I try to instill those values in my kids daily, uh, whether it's us cooking Hispanic food. I mean, if you guys want some uh, dishes, you know, come all at me. You know, I'll, I'll send you some recipes. Uh, gladly cook for you guys. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's I think it's a very fun. I, actually, we travel to Mexico quite frequently. Uh, and my kids, I try to instill, you know, hey, you know, this is what we used to do back in the old days. And, you know, and his, this is a little bit about our culture and they understand it and they're, you know, they follow it daily. Uh, I know my son's very proud of it. Uh, you know, he, he, he goes around his friends, he's like, dad, hey, I, I, you know, I taught my friends what we used to do. And hey, you know, such and such is having a quinceanera and, you know, just those types of events, I think are fun to me. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, there, there, there can be challenges, but it's, I think it's exciting. So. That's all I wanted to add. Yeah. Yeah, that's great to hear. I don't have any kids, so I'm not passing Spanish on any kids, but I, I do it to my friends who, if you're if you're in the in group, you get lucky enough to be invited over to Abuela's house when she's cooking beans or 
she's cooking her tamales and you, you're very special if you get one of the half dozen tamales when Christmas time rolls around. It's a very exclusive list and um, uh, people have been shunned from that list for saying that mm -hmm. the tamales were different shapes than they were expecting or they were not the right size that they wanted. So I know uh, everyone everyone probably has those stories. You, when you want to learn about a culture, you go to someone's abuela or something and you, you'll learn real quick. So. Last question here. I'd like to get into the last 15 minutes of some some actions we can take, something we can learn from uh, this Cradera Listens panel. And um, question is, I'll, I'll direct this to Jose: Is what would you want allies to know or begin to do to support the Hispanic or Latino community, and how can others show advocacy for it? I, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, here, here's my touch, uh, my base uh, on it, or my point of view on it, and and I think it's. Goes a lot to what Christina has illustrated and also what Carolina has illustrated here. While the term um, Hispanic, Latino, or Latinx refers to uh, various uh, Spanish speaking uh, communities uh, all over, there's a whole world of differences. Uh, you know, it's not just a common language, right? Not all Hispanics are the same. Uh, you know, it, every, you know his, being Hispanic means it's, it's so different to each and every one of us, it's particularly, I, I think I would say that everybody on this call, right? Uh, you know, Hispanics uh, are different in, in many ways, right? Our dialects are different. Our cultures are different. Our traditions are different. Our foods are different. We can have a battle for foods. I think everybody could could say, yes, we, you know, my food's better than yours or no, my tamales are better than yours. But it, it just goes to show you that I recommend for those that, you know, want to support the Hispanic or Latino community to not assume, uh, you know, that we are all the same and to learn about our differences, right? Uh, learn about the differences within our cultures, wh whether we're Puerto Ricanos, Col Colombianos, Dominicanos, uh, Mexicanos, I mean, it, it goes on and on, right? I mean, we're all uniquely different, right? Taste the differences in our food, taste the differences uh, or, or listen, listen to, to our music, right? Understand our perspective. And I think one of the biggest imperative things here is support our dreams, right? Support our dreams and support uh, and, and learn about our, our, our overall world, right? L learn about the Latino world. Uh, we're all uniquely defined and, you know, just don't, I don't, I don't think we can go under the assumption, right? We, we're just uniquely defined individuals. That's all I can add. That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that can be done. Uh, one of the things I like to recommend uh, for what you can do is um, it's it's no secret that there's many Latinos that are working and a lot of our service industry. They're working on your house, potentially putting roofs up They're They're in our communities doing hard, often hard labor and they can be glossed over or seen not seen in your community. Um, but I, something tiny thing, maybe a little bit cheesy, but when you see someone working on painting an outside of a house in your neighborhood or doing your na your neighbor's roof, just don't just walk by. If you're walking your dog, wave to them, say hi, make them feel a part of your community because it, odds are um, they come to the community. No one really says hi to them. They do their work and they may go home to a different part of the city or something. But it's a very small thing. But I think that level of inclusivity can be really helpful to just foster a better um, feeling of bringing them into whatever community you're a part of. Um, and I also want to extend that question, uh, what allies can do to, to support uh, to Olean as well. Um, any thoughts there? Yeah, uh, for me, it's uh, like listening our story. I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but really, you know, uh, it might be a little cliche, but, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, I think it's important to, um, you know, learn about what people's backgrounds are. And, and it's not just, you know, Latin. I think I think it goes around for everybody, uh, but certainly in the minority uh, community, minority communities, um, it, it's important to understand their perspective um, right before you certainly, you know, pass judgment or before you jump to conclusions. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm happy uh, at all points to, to share my, you know, my background and my history and my story. Um, and and I, I, I love it, right? I, again, it's, it's I'm proud of, of where I'm coming from, uh, where I came from, and uh, I'd, I'd love to, to share um, those experiences. Um, and uh, I think uh, that's one of the things that I am always asking people. The other piece too is, you know, like, uh, like Jose said, you know, taste our food, um, you know, don't, don't shy away from it. Um, you know, there's learn about the cultures, you know, it, it's, it's understand why, you know, people party on Cinco de Mayo, 
uh, understand, you know, why the same thing happens on St. Patrick's Day, right, from, a, from an Irish standpoint. So it's, it's, it's learn about, you know, those types of, of cultures and ceremonies, learn about uh, what's important to those in, within your team, right, talking about a, a team setting, right, it, it's, you know, it's, it's learn about their, their background, don't assume based on their name, don't assume based on what they look like, um, what they potentially their background is. Um, I think a lot of us are here to, you know, build relationships and grow those relationships. Um, and I think we, if we all have an open mind and, and are able to kind of have those deep connections, uh, we just become a, a, a much better firm and we become better people. Um, and, and that's something that um, I share externally and internally, right? I have to kind of continue to remind myself that um, I have to do the same, right? And, and, and everybody uh, needs to kind of have that that idea in the back of their mind whenever they're they're talking to to people, especially if they're new relationships. Excellent. Yep. And Carolina, I know you said you want to jump in here as well. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. So just really quick, I I wanted to piggyback off Jose and Olin and just say. Another thing that could be really helpful is to reflect kind of on you too. When you when you walk by those people that you see that are building your roof or helping with the fence, like think about what you're like, what are those thoughts that come in your head? Are they are they kind? Are they encouraging? Would they build someone up or would they tear someone down and, and be like, where does that come from? Why did why did my thoughts immediately go there and start start getting to the root of those things? And just remember that words can be really powerful. So like the jokes that we make, like those jokes, that stereotypical jokes, um, comments that we can make, quick half second adjustments we can, or uh, assumptions we can make on people. Like those are, your words are powerful and they they can be used to hurt people or build people up. And so my encouragement is when you, when you start, just start analyzing and, and just evaluating when you're, when you're in those situations. And then maybe even if you hear your friend say something, what does it look like to stand up to your friend and be like, why, why do you feel that way? Why, why, why do we go there? And so um, just another way that could just be, we could use to help each other and build each other up and continue to care for one another. Thanks, Carolina. And I think uh, we're getting close to the end here, but I, I do have a fun question that we have to ask. I, we're, we're all talking about the proud of our, our Costa Rican culture or Mexican culture. So I'll go to each person. I want to hear what is like a movie, a book, um, something, some media, something personal to you that you think exemplifies a piece of your culture, something that you maybe you grew up with or um, that others could take a look at and a bit understand a little bit more about your background or um, your 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 family and culture. So I'll start with uh, Jim Jimenez. Yeah, I knew you were going to call on me first. So <clears throat> one of the things I did a lot of growing up was uh, sat around with my mom while she listened to, to music. So I think her favorite type of music being from South Texas, she was born in a, a small town right, up, right outside of Harlingen, which is you know virtually a, a border town. Uh, she listened to, to Norteño music. So a lot of uh, 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 accordion in that. Um, every now and then they'll they'll mix in you know some mariachi music with that. But yeah, I think for me it was it was the music. So anytime I, I hear any any you know Hispanic music specifically, like I said mariachi or or Norteño, you know I think back to the times uh, growing up with my uh, you know sitting around the record player with my mom. So uh, yeah, I would say music. <laughs> It's a great memory. I know if you go walk into my abuela's house, she's got ranchero music on all the time. I, I think she's already burned out two radios from just consistently having it on the same channel while she does her daily tasks. Um, next, I'll go to Jose. All right, I'm sorry, Christian. My, I, my, my audio went in and out whenever you said, so can you repeat your question one more time? Yeah. Yeah, my question was, what's um, media similar to that's music? It's a book. It's um, a story, anything from your childhood or that anything that you think would be a great thing to for someone to learn a little bit more about your culture or background? Yeah, I think Jim hit that nailed it. I mean, uh, one of the biggest things is, I mean, you know, music, right? I, I love my music, right? Norteños, cumbias. I mean, I listen to all of it, salsa, merengue. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to encourage one thing. I mean, and, and I know, uh, I don't know if anybody here is a big Disney fanatic. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I am. I'm, I'm still, I'm still an inner child. I had kids, so I grew up on, on Disney. But uh, I recommend, you know, t two movies that I'd love for everybody to go out and watch. 
Uh, one of them is called Span uh, Spanglish, um, and that is a um, movie that I really, you know, find dear to my heart, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, a struggling in, uh, Mexican American that's actually here that has no, um, uh, you know, she does, doesn't understand English, uh, so she has her daughter be her translator. It kind of resembles me a lot, because I used to be my, uh, a translator for my parents, right? That's one movie. Uh, now, if you want to also get in tune with, uh, you know, touching a little bit on Dia de los Muertos, which is something that uh, is, you know, especially big here in Hispanic culture, is go watch Coco. Uh, that will tell you a lot about our uh, Dia de los Muertos. Uh, we actually are excited to uh, get ready to do that. Uh, we just had some recent passings in our family. So we're going to do a big, big, big uh, audio here at the house. And uh, yeah, I encourage you guys to go watch it. Yeah, that's a good one. It's a great movie. I uh, I think it's hard to not tear up when you watch that movie. Uh, it's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, Carolina, would you mind going next? Sure. Um, so if you all have seen the movie Up, that animated Pixar movie, I believe, that location takes place in Venezuela, which is really exciting. Um, so if you've ever watched it, you kind of seen a piece of Venezuela's uh, landscape and how vastly different it is but um gosh there's so many things music for sure food find yourself some tequeño some arepas and just try the food it's so good at christmas time we make um our version of tamales is called ayacas which is just kind of a corn base it's just like it's so good there's so many things out there um but find yourself a good tequeño food truck can confirm tequeños are in arepas are very very delicious uh next one is christina all right so two things well one jose we watch coco all the time and i don't tear up i cry at the end of that movie every single time it's just uh mama coco this just kills me but um so for me uh, it's music and then food. So music, there's a playlist on Spotify, Boleros Románticos. And it reminds me of my grandparents. Like I just, I play it every day when I'm cooking um, or just have it in the background. And it just brings back all these memories from the summer of spending my summers with my grandparents in Puerto Rico. That's what my mom would do. She'd put me on a plane and I would go to Puerto Rico with my grandparents and kind of bounce around. And it just reminds me of them, and I love listening to that. Um, it's very old-fashioned uh, Spanish music, but the other piece, similar, Christian, to you and your family, for Christmas, we have a day where all 25 of us come together, and we have an assembly line, and we make morcillas and pasteles. So pasteles are the Puerto Rican version of tamales, but it's plantains. Um, and I can fold a mean pasteles. So it's just... <laughs> like one of my favorite memories and we put everything in the freezer and then we parse it out for Christmas. And, um, you know, for Christmas in particular, we have 50 of our closest family members come over. We roast an entire pig in the backyard, not even kidding. Um, and that's where we pull out all the food and cook for anyone and everyone that would come over. Um, so it's always centering around music and it's definitely always centering around food. I, I really want some of the uh, the full full pig next time. Bring me a little leftovers. Totally, I will. <laughs> and uh, Callum, would you mind answering this? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the the best memories that stands out with me is um, the music and the dance. Um, I kind of knew my family was a bit different when I was younger because whenever we got together and uh, had parties as a family. Um, all my uncles and aunts would get up and start dancing to Latin music and uh, there'd be salsa, there'd be celebrating, there'd be lots of food. Um, so anytime that there is still a family get together, we still end up doing that. And whenever I brought friends over, they were a bit confused, but all joined in on the fun. That's great. Nothing like uh, forced people to do some salsa who've never done it before. They learn, you learn quick. And Aline. Yeah, I mean, I think f uh, food is uh, central to uh, a lot of our cultures. Uh, so uh, it's probably a, a theme that people are hearing. Uh, for me, it's uh, mole. And uh, my mom is in Oaxaca now, so I'm biased. But um, again, it's, it's just a very rich and complex sauce um that uh, varies tremendously so it's 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 you know being able to to taste the different flavors it, it's amazing how 
you know, north, south, east, west is just so different. Uh, so encouraging people that as they're traveling uh, to Mexico, certainly uh, to, to try the different uh, moles, it'll tell you a lot about that area of the, the country. Uh, from a book's perspective, you know, read things like uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is, you know, just has a, a lot of great books that are, you know, just reflective of the, the cultures and, um, you know, I, I think just bring out a lot of that kind of, you know, uh, culture, uh, there's just great stories as well. So, um, and then watching sports, you know, I'm a big football fan um, and always get an opportunity to watch uh, soccer whenever I can. Absolutely. By the way, All Mexico right, well, plays tonight. Uh, if anybody's oh, interested. that's right. USA and Mexico play tonight. <laughs> All right, so my, I'll do right. my quick answer. Mine's more lighthearted. I'll choose, if you ever have a chance, go to a Lucha Libre. You'll have so much fun. It's one of the most fun events. When I was in Oaxaca, I went to a whole night. It was like in a backyard, and there's just guys throwing chairs at each other, and it was a blast. So if you ever get a chance, you should go. <laughs> they have them even in Dallas at times. But uh, we got to stop things there, so we're going to wrap things up. Thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing your experiences today, hearing everyone's backgrounds. Got to learn even more about all of you, so I really appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who attended. We really uh, enjoy having everyone a part of this. So, muchas gracias y nos vemos pronto. Hi, everyone. <laughs>